大家好，欢迎来到小林 AI 实验室。今天我们将关注一个让所有人都在担心、都在思考的问题 ：AI 究竟是人类的威胁还是帮助？这个问题，仁者见仁，智者见智，很难有一个确定的答案。那今天我们将聚焦在神经学科学家、大学教授海泽尔·波林身上，听听他从神经学的角度剖析 AI 会是人类的威胁还是帮助。Now, artificial intelligence is just the simulation of human cognitive processes by machines, and the gold standard for the quality of this simulation is the Turing test since the 1950s. And passing it means the AI can fool a human into thinking it's conversing with another human. Now, no computer ever met that standard until recently. Now, five supercomputers have passed the Turing test. And the speed of advancement in AI has been remarkable. ChatGPT's improvement in knowledge, reason, and writing currently doubles every four months. Yeah, the comparable doubling time of the human brain would be three million years. Like the universe, it's complex, abundant. The cerebral cortex alone has 125 trillion synapses, so that's like the number of stars in 1,500 Milky Way galaxies. Now, computers have fewer connections than the human brain, yet they're capable of doing many things better and faster. And here's why: the brain evolved via the slow, clumsy process of natural selection. So its complex and flexible architecture isn't optimized for calculations. It's optimized for keeping us alive. Computers, on the other hand, are engineered, not evolved. They're designed for speed and precision in specific tasks. They're programmed rather than maturing over decades, and have a completely different physical structure. So as AI gets smarter and smarter, it can do more and more of what we can do, including problem solving and yes, even creativity. Yeah, that's an AI-generated image. But AI doesn't have experiences. It's not aware of itself like we are. It's not conscious, or is it? And how would we know? So first, let's define consciousness. So most scholars define it simply as first-person subjective experience. It's everything you experience when you're not in a deep, dreamless sleep, under general anesthesia, or dead. <laughs> Hopefully, you're not any of those. Okay.、Um, it's as simple as feeling the prick of a pin, tasting a sweet strawberry, or feeling elated by a hug from your beloved. You don't need intelligence, language, or even a sense of self to have it. And it's this rich subjective experience that distinguishes us humans from machines, at least for now. And it's all coded in our brain's networks of neurons firing, even though we still don't know exactly how. But beyond a working definition, we also need a theory of the neural basis of consciousness. And currently, there's no scientific consensus. But one leading contender, the Integrated Information Theory of Consciousness, or IIT, says that consciousness is a property of the universe, like gravity, and it emerges when physical systems have what's called intrinsic causal power. So you could think of this like symphonic power. It's like the harmonious, synchronized interplay of many individual instruments creating music. Consciousness and intelligence are not the same thing. Intelligence is about doing stuff, responding to a query, driving a car, planning for the future. In principle, and increasingly in practice, this can be simulated. But in the same way that a digital simulation of a black hole doesn't suck you into the computer, or a simulation of rain doesn't actually get your desktop wet, mere computational power can't fully simulate. Consciousness, subjectivity isn't rooted in function like speaking, but in physical matter with enormous intrinsic causal power. 
And even if we could replicate the functions of the brain, the so-called easy problem, understanding why and how those functions give rise to consciousness remains an open question. That's what we call the hard problem. And we're on our way to solving the easy problem, but the hard problem remains hard. And even though, yet, we still assume that other mammals, other animals, especially mammals, have consciousness since we have a similar hardware, a nervous system, evolutionary history, and behavior. So a cat will yelp and pull its paw away if you step on it, and it might even hiss at you as if it feels real pain. But the truth is, I don't even know if you're conscious. I mean, I, I only know my first-hand subjective experience, but I assume that you're conscious for the same reason that I assume that the cat is. But like a good neuroscientist, I assume AI is not conscious because it's just a simulation. But AI systems can irresistibly seduce our intuitions into believing that they're conscious, just like optical illusions can deceive us. Now, according to IIT, current AI systems can't be conscious because they don't have a sufficiently powerful causal structure. But conscious AI may be possible if we build a neuromorphic computer. So that is a computer that's designed to mimic the neural architecture and function of the human brain. So it would have artificial neurons and synapses to simulate the brain's neural networks. Scientists are now working on this, so conscious AI may not be too far off. Humans are incredibly resilient and adaptive to change. We evolve, as do our creations, our art, tools, and inventions. But we engineer those changes. The rise of AI and the speed of its advancement may feel like an inevitable evolution, but we make the decisions that determine what it will be and how we'll use it, at least for now. And we have the power to align AI with our values to ensure that it enhances our collective well-being with humans and AI amicably coexisting, complementing each other's strengths. Now, there's coexistence and then there's collaboration. So now, as a last resort, we can actually implant electrodes and use deep brain stimulation to treat disorders like Parkinson's disease, obsessive compulsive disorder, and depression. We can also implant microelectrode arrays to detect brain signals that a computer can translate into a machine and instruct, for example, to control a robotic device simply by a person using their own thoughts. So for example, a quadriplegic woman could drink a cup of coffee or type out a message just by thinking about it. Or a quadriplegic man can walk using a robotic Iron Man-esque suit just by thinking about walking. And I can imagine a future where humans merge with AI via brain-computer interfaces that allow us to augment ourselves and even evolve into a new species of human, or should I say, cyborg. We should view AI not as a threat to our humanity, but as a tool that can complement and enhance our human abilities. Perhaps it will allow us to be more human, to have more experience, more moments of connection, awe, and transcendence. One early promise of computers was that they'd save us time. But we all know they just busied us in new ways. But maybe AI can begin to fulfill that promise. Soon, we may be as casual about letting AI handle our email as we are now about asking GPS for directions. And AI will eventually be able to do much of what we can do, but it will never be what we can be. It may finally enable us to shift our balance from doing to being, allowing us more time for creativity, mindfulness, and using our bodies that have spent too much time sitting in front of computers. More time for play, even sex. Yes, 
The money quote from this talk is, AI will let us have more sex. Ha, 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 ha.